So the next thing that we are going to talk about is stress itself. So how do we identify, manage stress both in ourselves and then how do we observe it in other people so we can recognize it? Oh. So in this next section, what we're really going to just, yeah, again, focus on is stress itself. So what is our response to stress? How do we identify both the signals and the symptoms of stress? And then how do we go about managing it? And when I talk about managing stress, I don't mean managing what's causing the stress. I mean the stress itself. So this isn't how do I go talk to a banker about reducing my loans or how do I you know, summon the weather god to make it stop raining. This is how do I calm myself down so that I can start thinking about the problem that I'm facing in a clear manner. Or how do I realize that it's out of my control and I need to go talk to a health professional about it. Um, later on we'll talk about some of these other stuff with regards to how do you communicate stress with other people or how to communicate with someone who is showing these signs and symptoms of stress. Right now, we're going to kind of just focus on ourselves. Um, so you don't have to raise your hand if you feel uncomfortable, but how many people in here have been stressed? Right? Everyone here has felt stress at some point, which is good. Stress is a very common emotion. We all feel it at some point. So what is stress? So a whole bunch of really smart therapists and people who study stress on a regular basis defined it as the need or demand people confront as a that is perceived as burdensome or threatening and can lead to a physical or mental health problem. Now, all of us have had this at some point, um, and it's a natural response, and in some ways, it can be good. There are things that you should be stressed about. Large changes in your life, having a baby, getting married, going to college, sending your kids to college. Any sort of small disruption to your life should cause you a small amount of stress. But then there's other types of stress, things that are constantly burdensome, things that are always in the back of your mind, paying off those loans, the economy, natural fears of sort of stuff that's going on in your life. And that's where you can have some really adverse health effects happening because of them. Um, people have said that our ability to react and cope to fear is based off of our resources that are available to us. So this is material and financial resources, this is your psychological resources and your mental ability um, and stability, as well as your social network. So we're going to talk about those three throughout the day, so you'll see them constantly repeating over and over again. Okay, so what do you guys think are some stressors that farmers specifically would have to deal with that maybe an everyday person wouldn't. Weather. Okay, weather's a great one. I mean, I don't know of anyone who's not worried, a little worried about the weather on a day-to-day -day basis, but farmers in general, very, very stressed about the weather. And that's in part something they have absolutely no control over, right? What's some other things? Yeah, government regulations. It's another thing. You know, they can be as active as they want, they can lobby as much as they want, but at the end of the day, it's out of their hands. What are some other things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so financial thing and then their own health. And, you know, I know dozens of farmers that just short of having like a massive wound or a broken bone would just sort of take some Advil and get back on that tractor. So they're not always the best at um, self-care all the time. Okay, what are some other stressors that you guys can think of? Okay, commodity prices. Prices in general. Okay, so yeah, so trade, all of that kind of stuff. Anything else anyone can think of? So yeah, the social isolation, um, sometimes the social stigma of it, particularly if you're a farmer who's out in the public eyes a lot, they don't always have the, you know, within the farming community we kind of know and appreciate what they do, that's not always so out in the general public. What are some other things? What are some on-farm things that might cause stress? Yeah. 
There's definitely a toll on that social thing. What are some other stuff that could cause them stress? Equipment, that's a good one. <laughs> Technology, yeah. I mean, so I don't even have to harvest or plant 500 acres, but if my I get a flat tire, I'm stressed for the rest of the day, right? So like even tiny machinery breakdowns in our normal everyday life cause us stress. So just think about a massive piece of equipment if you're on a timeline, how stressful that can be. And that would be an easy fix, too. As soon as you get it fixed, that stress is gone. But if you're piling that on top of all this other stuff that we're talking about. So I think we named most of them. So weather is the first one. Thanks, Danny. It's obviously probably the biggest one that a lot of farmers are going to face. And it's one that they have absolutely no control over. Um, large debt loads. So particularly in beginning farmers, when they haven't paid off the land yet, or they haven't paid off that starting equipment, or if you have older farmers who might have loans that are completely unrelated to their farm. Um, you might have new farmers have student loans that still have to get paid off. Um, so that, that constant worry about, am I going to be able to pay this off? I've got all these other payments that have to get made and this loan on top of it. Government regulations was one you said. Again, something that's out of their control but could eventually you know, cause them to get so confused and held up with paperwork and other things that they might just decide it's not even worth farming anymore. Um, machinery breakdown, which Chuck mentioned. Again, this is one that tends to be more of an acute thing. It's short term. Once that machinery gets fixed, the stress goes away, but there's also that financial burden of what if it's a major part that breaks down? You know, what if I can't fix this? Um, high interest rates so that there's always a constant fear with that that Lisa kind of touched on. So one thing no one really mentioned was the actual crop itself. So the stress of just growing a crop. You know, am I going to get it in in time? Is it going to grow okay? Am I going to get a disease on it? Am I going to be able to control pests on it? Am I going to be able to afford to do all the control methods I need? Livestock, I feel like, are even twice as stressful than plants because then you have to worry about their well-building. Is my stress making the cows stressed? Because animals will feel on that. It's, it's a real thing. In livestock that's stressed tend to produce less. Um, milk, in the case of cows, they put on less meat in the case of other animals. So that could be another stressor. Um, commodity prices is always a big deal and lots of stress. And then disagreement with family members, particularly if you have multiple family members on a farm trying to manage a farm. Multiple chefs in a kitchen kind of situation. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone needs to make their livelihood off of this farm, but not everyone can all the time. Then it's an issue of, okay, Pop Pop's getting ready to retire. Who's going to take it over? Is dad taking it over? Is grandson taking it over? Does granddaughter want to stay in it? This can all lead to lots and lots of stress. Okay, so now we're going to watch a little video. I'm going to take a little break from talking. Cramming for a test? Trying to get more done than you have time to do? Stress is a feeling we all experience when we are challenged or overwhelmed. But more than just an emotion, stress is a hardwired physical response that travels throughout your entire body. In the short term, stress can be advantageous, but when activated too often or too long, your primitive fight-or-flight stress response not only changes your brain, but also damages many of the other organs and cells throughout your body. Your adrenal gland releases the stress hormones cortisol, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, and norepinephrine. As these hormones travel through your bloodstream, they easily reach your blood vessels and heart. Adrenaline causes your heart to beat faster and raises your blood pressure, over time causing hypertension. Cortisol can also cause the endothelium, or inner lining, of blood vessels to not function normally. Scientists now know that this is an early step in triggering the process of atherosclerosis, or cholesterol plaque buildup in your arteries. Together, these changes increase your chances of a heart attack or stroke. When your brain senses stress, it activates your autonomic nervous system. 
Through this network of nerve connections, your big brain communicates stress to your enteric or intestinal nervous system. Besides causing butterflies in your stomach, this brain-gut connection can disturb the natural rhythmic contractions that move food through your gut, leading to irritable bowel syndrome, and can increase your gut sensitivity to acid, making you more likely to feel heartburn. Via the gut's nervous system, stress can also change the composition and function of your gut bacteria, which may affect your digestive and overall health. Speaking of digestion, does chronic stress affect your waistline? Well, yes. Cortisol can increase your appetite. It tells your body to replenish your energy stores with energy-dense foods and carbs, causing you to crave comfort foods. High levels of cortisol can also cause you to put on those extra calories as a visceral or deep belly fat. This type of fat doesn't just make it harder to button your pins. It is an organ that actively releases hormones and immune system chemicals called cytokines that can increase your risk of developing chronic diseases such as heart disease and insulin resistance. Meanwhile, stress hormones affect immune cells in a variety of ways. Initially, they help prepare to fight invaders and heal after injury, but chronic stress can dampen the function of some immune cells, make you more susceptible to infections, and slow the rate you heal. Want to live a long life? You may have to curb your chronic stress. That's because it has even been associated with shortened telomeres, the shoelace tip ends of chromosomes that measure a cell's age. Telomeres cap chromosomes to allow DNA to get copied every time a cell divides without damaging the cell's genetic code, and they shorten with each cell division. When telomeres become too short, a cell can no longer divide, and it dies. As if all that weren't enough, chronic stress has even more ways it can sabotage your health, including acne, hair loss, sexual dysfunction, headaches, muscle tension, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, and irritability. So, what does all this mean for you? Your life will always be filled with stressful situations, but what matters to your brain and entire body is how you respond to that stress. If you can view those situations as challenges you can control and master, rather than as threats that are insurmountable, you will perform better in the short run and stay healthy in the long run. Okay, so that video is a TED Talk. It's one of my favorites. Um, but they mentioned repeatedly about cortisol, which is a hormone that our bodies produce when we're stressed, and we also produce it when we're scared. Um, what it actually does is it increases the amount of glucose or sugar that's in your bloodstream. Now, this normally would trigger some, for instance, like your flight or flight response. It can also just trigger you to, your body to motivate, to move forward. So in small amounts, this is great, right? This, again, is what we want in an everyday little situation when we just have small little bouts of stress. The problem is, is when you repeatedly are having this constantly flowing into your bloodstream, your ability to think sort of gets hindered. So I want you guys to think of this as your brain, okay? It's got a little red tinge because we are Maryland, but normally you're clear-headed, right? You can think. If I gave you a problem, you could solve it. If you become stressed, you become a little less clear-headed. But, you know, a few minutes, you'll calm down, you'll figure it out, right? And slowly start to see my hand again through the back. When it's chronic, over and over and over again, you never get a chance to calm down. You never get that second to catch your breath, to think clearly. So this is when you start making rash decisions, or no decision at all. This is the issue with chronic stress, is that you can't think clearly, and you can't even start to consider how to solve the problem that's causing you stress. So there are tons of negative health effects that come with this kind of chronic stress. So you'll have dramatic changes in your mood, you'll have dramatic changes in your habits, with your fears, and what motivates you. 
Um, heart disease is increased with people who are dealing with chronic stress. You'll also have a lower immune response. Uh, digestion and sleep problems can both arise due to chronic stress. Um, issues with memory and concentration can arise. Anxiety and depression are quite common, as well as just a lower life expectancy like the video showed us. Okay, so what does stress look like? So now what we're going to do is a little bit of a group activity. I'm going to pass out some cards and I want you and the people at your table to take a few minutes to just write down what you guys think stress looks like. What are some signs and symptoms of stress? What are some physical symptoms? What are some mental ones? What are some emotional ones? What are some psychological ones? You can think of your own life, you can think of people that you know who are stressed. Just talk amongst yourselves. And if you want to write things down on the cards, you can. If you want to just mentally think it, that's fine too. Okay, so what were some of the signs and symptoms that you guys came up with? There's no wrong answer here, so don't feel like, you know, irritability, that's great. I am super irritable every time I am stressed. You can ask my coworker. I think I was screaming and yelling at him all day yesterday as I was trying to make sure that we had all the handouts for today. What are some other ones? Withdrawal, withdrawal yeah. People who are stressed tend to withdraw from things. They don't go to a lot of their normal stuff. They don't talk that much. Yeah. Lack of motivation, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you might have the opposite. You might have people that instead of withdrawing are now really putting themselves out there. They may not be saying a lot, but they might have this need to talk. What did you say? I'm sorry. Yeah, disorganization. Especially when you're stressed. It's really, again, if you're not thinking clearly, it's hard to remember where everything goes when your brain is cloudy. What were some other ones people had? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We definitely um, indulge more or less sometimes. You, know, you tend to find people who, when they're stressed, uh, they might be a person who smokes one cigarette a day and now they're doing half of a pack just because they've got to have something to do. Eating's the same way. A lot of us, I know I comfort eat all the time. I'm stressed, let's go, you know, get a Mm-hmm, oh yeah, so. Even people who don't necessarily have addictive personalities, a lot of times when they're stressed one day. But yeah, if you have an addictive personality, stress can definitely bring that forward and that forward. Um, can you really think of any physical things? My blood pressure, okay. Up or is clean. Okay. Any other ones anyone can think of? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, risk taking can definitely be. And part of that again comes back to my ability to concentrate, my ability to evaluate whether or not it's a risk. Or it could be I'm stressed because I've got ten things on my list. I don't have time to double check to make sure the equipment's right. I'm just gonna assume it's right. It's always been right before. Right? So that's a good one. So here's the list that Michigan State and us came up with together. So some physical things, so headaches, back aches, eating problems, so the indulgence, um, sleeping problems. I know when I'm stressed I have a hard time falling asleep. In my mind I'm always thinking of everything that I've got to do. Frequently being sick, so people who suffer from chronic stress commonly have uh, more outbreaks of upper respiratory disease. Exhaustion can be the other one. So again, you may not be able to sleep well, but you might mentally and physically just be tired. So some emotional ones, people can feel sad, they can be depressed, bitterness, anger, anxiety, a loss of spirit, a loss of sense of humor. You can also have the opposite, which is kind of almost what Jenny was talking about, where they are 
They are so caught up in it that they're overdoing it to try to hide the stress that they're having. Um, behavior, so irritability was one from over here, backbiting, acting out, passive aggressive behavior, anger, increased drinking, um, taking drugs or increased drug use, isolation, and violence can all be caused by stress. So some cognitive, so some mental ones, memory loss, lack of concentration, difficulty making simple decisions, someone mentioned that one, and then your self-worth can also be this. You can have someone who you would normally think of has a really high self-esteem, is really good, they know that they're worth something. Um, and yet over time with chronic stress, they'll start to feel like a failure. Their self-worth will decrease. Um, they feel like they can't do anything right or that everything in their life is past the point of being fixable. So many farmers um, are experiencing financial and emotional stress due to economical hardship. Um, here are several signs and symptoms that we can look for specifically in them to kind of cue in to think if they are potentially having stress and then if we need to extend that hand that we'll talk about later on how to get them help. So a change in routine is something that's really common, whether it's they used to call Jenny once a week and now they're calling her daily to check on grain prices. Um, maybe they used to be really active at their church in place of worship, or they were really active in community groups like scouting or 4-H, and now they're just not. Um, their ability to care for their livestock and crops might go down. So you might have a farmer who would say, that farmer normally has the best looking cows I've ever seen, but you know, I went by their field the other day, and they just weren't looking that great. Or, oh no, that farmer always has, you know, the cleanest fields, there's never a weed in sight, but I drove by it the other day and you should see the weeds are up to the knees. Um, increased illness, so again, that upper respiratory disease can really kick in when you're dealing with chronic stress. Um, the appearance of the farmstead, so not just the animals and the crop itself, but the actual farm can look really bad. So are buildings being maintained? Is equipment being maintained? Um, their non-farm stuff can also start to apply to this. I'm sure a lot of us have or know of some farmer that their farm truck is always a disaster, but the truck they drive around town is always on point. And when that truck starts to deteriorate to look more like the farm truck, that might be a warning sign. Um, children will also start to show this. So even if the parents are doing their best to sort of hide financial burdens and stress from the kids, the kids may pick up on cues the same way that animals a lot of time will. Or the kids themselves might actually have their own separate stress. So this could lead to them acting out in school or having behavioral issues of their own. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is take a few minutes to talk about how we handle this stress. So again, this isn't how you handle what's causing the stress, this is the stress itself. So how do you get your mind back to this clear-headed? So when it's this, how do you calm down so that it, that stress can fall out, so that you can think again? So the first thing we're gonna do is some deep breathing exercises. Um, so if you feel more comfortable closing your eyes and engaging in this, that's fine. If you wanna keep your eyes open, that's okay. I am gonna keep the lights on since we are filming. Um, I just broke the third wall barrier, check that out. Um, but just concentrate on what I'm saying and kind of relax your mind and your brain. These are timed, so I'm going to grab my phone. Okay. Okay, so the first one we're going to do is called a box breathing exercise. So what it's going to entail is you're going to take a deep breath in for four seconds. You're going to hold it for four seconds. You're going to exhale for four seconds. And then you're going to hold the exhale for four seconds. We're going to repeat this a few times, OK? So I'll count the four seconds out. So again, we're going to breathe in. One, two, three, four. Hold. One, two, three, four. Breathe out. Two, three, four. Hold. Breathe in, hold, exhale, hold, inhale, 
Now, how many of you guys feel your mind just being a little bit more clear? Yeah, okay. So, try doing this at home. Um, when you're not necessarily sitting here and having someone count for you, it tends to work a lot better. So, just kind of do this on your own. And the four seconds is kind of just to even it out. But I normally say, like, you'll feel, like, you want to feel your body get tensed, and then you want to feel your body release. And then you want to tense and release, okay? So that leads us to the second one that we're gonna do is called a free breath reset, and it's that same kind of idea. You're gonna hold a breath, you're gonna tense, you're gonna release it. Your second breath, you're gonna tense again, a little less, and then you're gonna release it. And then that third breath, you're gonna breathe in positive energy, and you're gonna breathe out positive energy for your neighbors, okay? So that first breath, we're gonna take it nice and deep. You're gonna feel it in your belly. You're gonna let it out. The second breath, you're gonna tense. So really feel it more in your lungs. And let it go. Now this next breath as you breathe in, I want you to think about how amazing of a person you are. Just a positive thought. You can do this. You're an amazing person, okay? Positive energy comes into our body. Now as you breathe out, think of the positive energy you want to tell your neighbors or your friends. Remind them that they're good people, that they can conquer mountains, that they can take on the challenges of the day, okay? So we're gonna do this again. Deep breath, filling our lungs. And out. Second breath, tension. Do it so you can feel it in your belly, in your neck. Now release that tension as you breathe out. Now third breath, positive in, positive out, okay? Oh, thanks, Siri. Anyway, okay, so these are just two little simple breathing exercises. You can go online and find lots and lots of them. The nice thing about these is the idea again here is that we wanna get ourselves back to being clear-headed. These are simple, they don't take a lot of time, and they don't require anything. You don't have to carry around a glass jar full of glitter in order to clear your mind, right? You can breathe. Um, the people in Michigan State talk about how a lot of their farmers, after learning these kinds of things, would do them on their daily routine as they just walk around their farm to double check things. Because you could do this when you were walking from the house to the equipment or from the house to the barn. You could just take a few deep breaths and it could just clear your mind so that you could be ready for the rest of the day. Now, if the positive thinking was not really something that you're keen on doing, again, it doesn't have to be as over the top as I was doing it, but we do want to talk about self-talk. So this is that thought in the back of your head. Some of us hear it a little bit louder than others, but all of us probably hear it. A lot of times you'll hear it when you are stressed out because it's that negative thought that says, you're overwhelmed, you can't do this, toss in the towel. What we want to do is change that so that it's positive. Yes, I can do this. Yes, I've done this before. I'm capable. And it doesn't have to be a full thought like this. This could be a line from a song or a little prayer or a poem or three simple words that you would just repeat in your head that make you generally feel proud of who you are. Okay? This can be the name of your kids or your grandkids. Okay? This can be whatever it is that you need it to be to help you calm your mind, to remind yourself that you are valuable and that you are important. Okay, Meditation is kind of a longer extension of both of these combined together. I'm not going to focus too much on that, um, but it definitely has a place in this. Exercise is another key thing, and I know 
When I talked to my farmers about exercising, they would roll their eyes. They would be like, I'm out in the field walking all day. I get enough exercise. Um, but it's making sure that they do take some time, whether it is a 20 minute walk every day around their property, or if it's actually going to a gym or exercising. But that physical endurance on your body can help curb a lot of these chronic uh, stress things. It can help really alleviate some of the stomach issues, the sleep problems, the exhaustion. It can also help take some of that glucose out of your bloodstream just by burning it off. It will also help to deter some of the negative health effects that come from just sitting around. So even the ones that aren't related to stress. Um, connecting with your social network is another great way to handle stress, whether that's just calling and telling someone, I'm stressed. Sometimes that's all you need to say. I'm stressed. I'm sorry that you're stressed. Do you want to talk about how stressed? Nope. I just want to acknowledge I'm stressed. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about social networks and the importance there, but the next thing is if, you know, when you're doing all of this stuff, you might come to the realization that you can't handle this that you are overwhelmed. And then it's that taking that step to know, I need to talk to someone who is more authorized in this. I need to go seek some mental health. And there's nothing wrong with that. Lots of people go talk to mental health professionals. Um, it's really important. Okay, so in your guys' handout packets, you should have a handout called My Action Plan. Um, so we're not going to do this here right now because we kind of talked about a lot of it already but at some point either today during lunch or when you get home this is a really good thing for you to kind of look over and you can pair that with the five-step approach to alleviating farm stress to come up with your own action plan on how you would like to deal with your own stress and then in return how you can help other people potentially deal with theirs. And we're not asking anyone here to fulfill the role of a mental health professional. Um, what we're asking is what you can do as an everyday friend or coworker or advisor to someone who is in a stressful situation, okay? So when it comes to social support, they did a survey and out of 190 farmers, they realized that the ones that had lower social support networks were the ones that were at more risk for things like depression and anxiety and eventually things that like suicide. Um, having a social support system really promotes a healthy communication. Um, it allows for an organized kind of designated time or period in which you can have an opportunity to communicate with other people as well as just being able to communicate about stress and other issues that people are going through kind of destigmatizes mental health related issues in the treatment. So saying something as simple as, I'm stressed out and I'm feeling overwhelmed, and then your friend saying, I'm sorry you feel that way, maybe you need to go speak to someone, tells that person that it's okay. Um, and particularly in our older white male farming demographic, which is still the majority of farmers, mental health still has a, a stigma to them. Um, you know, we're just now starting to kind of destigmatize it. So they're not necessarily likely going to want to go get help or limit that they need to go get it. Is it okay? I did not. I thought they were in there. Well, okay. We'll do that then. Okay, if you don't have the handout, um, we will have everyone's email address. So what we're actually gonna do is a lot of these handouts, we will email around to you guys so that you have access to them. And particularly some of the ones in there that are good resources for you to give to farmers, we'll make sure that you get the PDF so then you can print them out as needed. Okay, so with that, does anyone have any questions about any of the stuff I've talked about? So the physical aspects of stress or how to just calm your own mind to kind of deal with it? Yeah, so we do have a list of some resources that you can definitely contact in order to help find 
mental health care providers and ones that will do it either at a lower rate or pro bono rate. Um, there are some national hotlines that will help connect you with that. Um, so we'll hand out kind of those resources at the end, but there is definitely a lack of them, particularly in rural communities. Um, the ability to get to one sometimes, particularly if you live an hour or so out of town, how many farmers do you know are going to drive an hour into town, spend an hour talking to someone, spend an hour to drive back when there's you know, fields that need to get planted or cows that need to get milked. So it's definitely an issue um, that needs to sort of get approached at some point. No, yeah, and it's it's something we'll talk about a little bit later, but this need to kind of get away from the farm sometimes, to block out that time. And maybe it's not every day, maybe it's three times a week, and it's let's go to a park, or you know, let's let's go walk down the drive that doesn't lead us to anything that's related to our own farm. Like that. So yeah, that's a good point. Just walking around your farm is just going to point out more farm duties that you have to do. That's the downside of a farm is there's always something that has to be done on it, so, okay. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chuck. I learned a valuable lesson last fall. I thought I got enough activity. I walk, I teach, I do multiple things. I now take an exercise class. And boy, I come out of exercise class on a high. It's a real important thing that the endorphins that are released in that organized exercise class are just tremendous. So I'm a big advocate for that type of activity. So uh, I can't say anything negative about, I thought treadmills would be boring. I'm enjoying my my time on a treadmill. <clears throat> so, enough on that. Mm -hmm.